Where did you serve? Uh, World War II. And what was your branch of service? Uh, Army Air Corps. And your, what was your highest rank? Tech Sergeant. Tech Sergeant in the Army Air Corps. And in what general locations did you serve? And you can kind of start from you know, where you went to basic training and, and just kind of progress through time mm -hmm. as to where you, where you served. Well, I was Southeast Training Command uh, for about three years all over uh, the southern and central uh, air bases. And uh, then I went uh, for overseas to uh, India and China. And were you drafted or did you enlist? <laughs> I enlisted. Enlisted. <laughs> they, uh, uh, they, in fact, it was five days after my 18th birthday. Uh, I, there were three of us, two of my buddies. They waited till I was old enough, and we all uh, joined up together. And interestingly enough, uh, our uh, enlistment papers say that we were assigned to uh, uh, Turner Field in Albany, Georgia, and we went first to. Uh, Maxwell Field and slept in a hangar for a couple of days right on the flight line, flight line, and uh, then did some very basic training, military training there, and then uh, we went up to Albany, Georgia, just north of uh, Alabama, and uh, that was interesting. The, uh, the time this was before the war. This was April, uh, you know, well before the war started. April forty-one. April forty-one, correct. And uh, the, it was interesting that Time magazine uh, had uh, a story about us going up there into this little sleepy South Georgia town of Albany and uh, how all the mothers there were concerned for their daughters with all these terrible soldiers coming into town. <laughs> so. Well, when you enlisted, Bill, where were you living at the time? Somerville, Massachusetts. Enlisted in Boston. Why did you join the service? Yeah, I was waiting for that question. <laughs> uh, when I got out of high school in, in uh, 1940, uh, there were no jobs. I wound up, you know, being a soda jerk and have to and split shifts and have to go all the way over the other side of Boston to, for the job. And this was stupid. <laughs> I was smarter than that, I thought, and uh, so I signed up for a, a, a government training program to be a machinist, and I, I went to school at the Somerville Vocational for uh, almost two years before it was through, learned to be a machinist. And that was all before your enlistment? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what I was doing in, for about a year and a half after waiting till I turned 18. You were saying you, you didn't actually go to a, a full basic training camp? You, did, that was your basic training, what you were discussing earlier about? That was my basic training, yes. yes. <laughs> wow. Um, so after you finished your basic training, where did you go from there after you finished that week or so? Of basic we, we went from there, from which was Maxwell Field, up to Albany, Georgia, Turner Field. And uh, I was there for several months, well, quite a few, uh, maybe five months, six months, uh, as an aircraft mechanic. And it's interesting that the two fellows that I joined with, uh, one had a, a private pilot's license, and uh, he wound up driving a gas truck, and the other fellow wound up uh, playing the trumpet in the band. And I was the only one that was working on airplanes, and that's what we all signed up to do. And... Uh, then shortly, I was there for quite a while. I had my own responsibility for an airplane and uh, made PFC finally. <laughs> and uh, they sent me up to Boston uh, to go to New England Aircraft School. And uh, I would live right next door to Boston. And uh, it was, uh, you know, before the war. And we lived in a hotel and went to school in the, in the New England Aircraft School. And uh, I went home weekends. Uh, you know, some of it was right there, and I spent the weekends at home 
dressed in civilian clothes and, uh, until you know, December 7th. And that's when it hit the fan. And uh, uh, while we were there, that ha I was at home Sunday morning and uh, we heard this news about Pearl Harbor. And uh, we were all called, re returned back to uh, the hotel where we were staying, which is just off Fenway Park. And uh, so uh, we did that, and they brought us into assembly and told us that we were now in the Army. And the interesting part is when they sent us up to Boston, that about four or five of the fellows were draftees, not a regular Army. And we got up there, and they said, we're not training you. And, for just the one year you're in the army yeah, as a draftee, so they sent them all back, and uh, so uh, that, that was. They were all from the Boston area too. They were heartbroken, but uh, but we uh, then that night, Sunday night, uh, if you're familiar with Boston and you know the uh, Hotel Buckminster in, in Kenmore Square, which is you see it all the time at Red Sox games on the television, but uh, they gave me a rifle. <laughs> I don't think we had ammunition, but they, I, uh, I was pulling guard duty around Kenmore Square and Fenway Park and, and the Hotel Buckminster and cold as a son of a gun. <laughs> so that was my contribution to Pearl Harbor Day. But uh, we finished the courses there and uh, sent back to, to Turner Field in, in Albany. And uh, while I was gone, uh, I'd been transferred to Moody Field in Valdosta, Georgia, which was also brand new, the same as we went to Turner Field. There were no planes there, and there, was, there wasn't any, We had outside latrines and pretty much started over again that uh, Moody Field was brand new. Moody? Moody Field in Valdosta, Georgia. And uh, that's still operative, Turner Field. Well, there's a ballpark in Atlanta at Turner Field, but this different one. <laughs> the uh, uh, no uh, Moody Field is still operating. This is a Marine detachment there, and uh, what in both places we were training uh, pilots uh, in advanced training, and uh, in fact at Turner Field we had a lot of uh, British pilots uh, were getting their advanced training there, but the same thing a single engine. Uh, AT-6s and uh, North American plane, and uh, I was going along pretty well there, and uh, then we get, after a while, there was another new field opened up, and was a bunch of us were sent up there to uh, George Field in Lawrenceville, uh, Illinois, which is right on the Wabash River across from Vincennes, Indiana. Vincennes was the big city, and Georgefield was uh, uh, very rustic. I mean, it was top paper barracks and three pot belly stoves down the middle of the, the bunk room, and, you know, a fire watch every night and smoke about eye level right down through the, through the barracks. But uh, uh, I, I was very contented there. I loved what I was doing. Uh, I gradually... Uh, became a, a, a flight leader, a uh, tech sergeant with uh, about 20 airplanes and, and 40 uh, mechanics that I was responsible for on rotating eight-hour shifts. And uh, they eventually, instead of being just a group of planes, and they set up a uh, production line maintenance facility in one of the hangars. And... Uh, Different change orders would come through that had to be complied with, inspections and so forth. And I was put in charge of a crew to, uh, to do that. Uh, and one of the problems was to change the landing gear switch. It was an electric switch. And uh, when the pilots were accustomed to putting the landing gear in the down position, so when they take, took off, you know, they were sure that the, the gear was going to stay down. Uh, well, somebody put one in upside down, and I was responsible for checking them. And what I did was put the plane up on jacks and have one of the mechanics go up and throw the switch. Well, he threw the switch down, 
uh, and it was up. So when the plane was taking off the next morning, uh, before they were able and the gear came up when they bellied in. And uh, so I had finished the, the eight o'clock in the morning. I was through and I went to breakfast, the mess hall. When I come back, they told me that the, the uh, major down at group engineering wanted to see me. <laughs> so uh, that was the story of my fall from, from uh, glory. Uh, for breakfast, I was a tech sergeant. For lunch, I was a private. And uh, that was kind of tough. I mean, I, I had worked hard to get that. And I, I hadn't, in fact, I was very well appreciated by the commanding officer of the group and stuff. He wanted me to go to West Point. No, he wanted me to go to Officer Candidate. And he got, uh, said, you know, if I'm going to be an officer, I want to be a West Point officer. I told his fine captain. <laughs> So he said, why don't you? And uh, we put in the application two years in a row, but one of them that was never forwarded, and the other one never answered. So I, I never really got the chance. But uh, I wound up, after the reduction in grade, as a private, uh, having a, a, a new second lieutenant uh, engineering officer assigned to work with me. I was going to train him. So... <laughs> There I am, a private, and uh, I got this. And the first sergeant, I don't think, appreciated it because he never put me in for an uh, increase in grade from private to anything. And uh, this officer put me in for, for uh, first, uh, no, corporal. And uh, the next month I wasn't on anything. He puts me in again for sergeant. And I think the first sergeant... He didn't like me anyhow because I was regular army. Regular army went to the head of the pay line, and he wasn't. So I'm getting paid before he does, and you know, just kind of <laughs> tickled the uh, first sergeant. So I wound up then being uh, transferred to uh, radio school at Scott Field. And, uh, Scott Field is where? Scott Field, Illinois. <clears throat> it was the major... Uh, uh, radio training school, and uh, here I am with three years. I got I was three years in the service. Then I had to get a, a hash mark. They didn't know what I was after, but uh, so I went there and I figured, well, I'll learn something while I'm here. But it was a, a obvious mal assignment. I should, with all that mechanic background, even though I was only a sergeant. Uh, they should have sent, wasted that and sent me to radio school. So I, I tried to get out on a malassignment, and uh, they said, you'll graduate before that goes through. So I said, well, I'm stupid. I won't pass anything. And the CO there was a, uh, a, a World War I veteran, a, ca a captain, and uh, he, he was smart enough and old enough and wise enough to say I was right. So he says, okay, he says, you're passing these, you're not passing these intentionally. And I said, that's right. And he says, okay, you're going to teach electricity in the very basic first sessions here until we find a place for you. So he uh, did that and uh, he, I had to go before a board and uh, they one lieutenant, he made some crack about, oh, you don't want to go overseas. And the captain says, that's enough of that. <laughs> and uh, so I uh, went along with it. And uh, They sent me then to uh, <clears throat> Stinson Field in San Antonio, Texas, uh, in, a, in an outfit that was just being formed to go overseas. Uh, the outfit was a 382nd Air Service Group, the 598th uh, 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 Air Service Command, I guess, or something. But uh, so we we were being collected together to go over to service B twenty nines that were being set up in India first, and then in China. And uh, by the time we got over there, the B twenty nines they had established bases out in the Marianas. And for them to fly from China, it took dozens of 
planes to bring the gas up to them. And they could, you know, it would be maybe once a month they'd have enough to fly it. So they sent all the B-29s over over to the Pacific and the Marianas and flew from there. So but we had no place to go. <laughs> so that's why you see all those badges that I have up there for the different air commands that uh, we were in the 10th, the 14th, and the 20th, all, all free with some only a week with the, the 14th, the Flying Tigers, you know. But uh, so that went along fine. We finally were settled in and were taken care of. Mostly uh, C-46s, planes were ferrying troops and supplies to the British and American armies over in Burma. And we were in Chittagong, which was right on the on the border of uh, Burma and Hell, <laughs> and uh, so we that's that's where we were going along. And uh, pretty soon they they were sending us up into China, and there were no B twenty nines up there, but they were finding looking for a place that to where we could, and they <clears throat> we we were assigned to Luchao, China which was there were two air bases that were overrun by the Japanese up there. One was Luchao and one was Guilin. And uh, both bases had been destroyed by the Americans uh, because they weren't leaving nice barracks and stuff there. And anything, anything that could be destroyed was destroyed. And we went up there, we had a, a sleep in tents and everything, and everything was in tents. And uh, just on the basis, the cement base that they had. Uh, so that that's uh, where we were when uh, up in Luchao, China, when the war ended. When the war ended. The war ended, and uh, so two days after. You want me to keep going? Yeah. <laughs> two days after the the uh, war ended, uh, they they put me in charge. By then, I was I was back to being a tech sergeant. <laughs> And uh, so uh, they put me in charge of uh, about 15 guys and sent us up to, to Peking uh, at the end of the war because they were flying uh, uh, C-46s loaded with Chinese uh, troops, nationalist troops, to go up there and go and fight the Chinese Reds over in western China. So there were all kinds of... But we had a very basic uh, ability to put gas in the airplanes. They took four 50-gallon uh, drums and split them lengthwise, welded them together so that there was a long trough of four of uh, these half 50-gallon uh, drums. And uh, we would take, we had built a ramp and would pour gasoline into the trough and we had a little gas pump to pump the gas up into the airplanes. So the airplanes were lined up and would taxi along and stop at the gas pump, <laughs> put gas in them. But they all they, they all wanted to get into Peking to see the, the Forbidden City and all that stuff. The pilots, I mean. And uh, they pulled every kind of stunt. The spark plugs weren't right and this and that. We'd have to, you know, check them out anyhow. But... Uh, and then they were they were uh, running money exchanges because all the all the Chinese money and Japanese money in Peking was uh, no good, and uh, they were buying money bring down in southern China and bringing it up there and making a nice profit. So, <laughs> but uh, but we were barracked in Peking in the Grand Hotel de Peking, uh, right out, just outside the walls, the great walls of the Forbidden City. And the Japanese were in control of everything. They had all the guns and uh, doing the regular police work. Even the Marines hadn't arrived yet. So, uh, But they uh, they gave me a Thompson submachine gun when they were sending me up there. And I, I said, it'd be stupid to walk around with that. <laughs> And so I put it in a closet in a hotel room and forgot about it. In fact, I even came home, and as far as I know, it's still in the closet. <laughs> but, uh, no, it, it was quite a quite a uh, thing there. We saw all kinds of 
big wheels coming in from, from China and from Russia and the United States. And uh, there's pictures there that I have of uh, surrender ceremonies in China. And, uh, but uh, it, it, we'd, for, we'd travel to the Forbidden City, went all the way through it. And uh, we worked seven days a week, uh, but uh, we did find evenings off. And uh, eventually some Marines arrived. They were down at the, the, the ocean there by Tianjin. And when they come up to uh, to Peking, we had a sign up, uh, welcome U.S. Marines, courtesy of the Army Air Corps. <laughs> so, but uh, th that's where I finished. Uh, they sent me home from there uh, down to Shanghai to, to catch a, a boat home, and I missed it by a day, so I had a, a month or so in Shanghai, uh, which was pretty interesting. I, I ran across a, a fellow there that was a, had a, a big uh, French restaurant going on, Chez Rovere, and uh, he, had a, uh, he treated us to <laughs> dinner a couple of times. So, But back in, in Peking, there was the uh, manager of Paramount Pictures for all of North China at a uh, restaurant nightclub there. And uh, a lot of nights we go down there. And, uh, he was my guys that were working with me, and uh, he, he uh, put had his wife, a very beautiful Chinese woman, uh, sit with us there. And this and these Marines had come in, and we had dancing with her. And <laughs> they, it was nobody could touch her. That's why he put her there because we would be nice to her and take care of her. So we had. That was some of the fun part, but uh, so uh, just well in in uh, December we started home on a baby flat top, the the uh, USS Anzio, and uh, they they set it up to be a troop ship, but uh, I couldn't sleep either going over or coming back below deck, so I'd sleep out on the deck, and it was all right because we'd be underneath unless it rained, and oh, it would wash down through us, but. Uh, but it was an absolutely beautiful sea trip. It was calm, full moon, and it took us a month. We arrived in Seattle on uh, Christmas Eve. 1945? 45, right. And uh, then <clears throat> we were there for a few days, and they put us on a train to Fort Devens in Massachusetts, and on uh, January 6th, I was discharged. So that's the story, right. in short. <laughs> Good story. Yeah. So, so I didn't do anything heroic. <laughs> you, you didn't see any combat? Or, no. Did you, were, were I you saw a lot of the effect of combat. Yeah. I saw a lot of going up into, through China, there was a lot of Japanese ships, uh, planes that were downed and stuff that I saw. And uh, in, in uh, the, airport, the air base where we set up to service these ships, at one part of the field with all the Japanese former mechanics and stuff. and uh, I, We never had really much to do with them, that's all. And did you have a, did you lose, or did they lose any planes that you were responsible for that were under you as far as maintenance and so on? Did they all always oh, come back or when, did the, they you know, not return? The Japanese planes? The planes you were working on you, oh. at any time throughout. Or you went to Japan when you're in stateside, or when you're in, in China and Japan. No, the, the, did I have any problem with them? Or? Yeah, did you have any planes that were lost, that were lost in a battle? Or they were all just pretty much transport from planes. They had no problems with. No, with losing or ships or anything like that. No, uh, except the one that I <laughs> put the wrong switch in. <laughs> but no, there. There were a lot of, uh, you know, heavy duty stuff, uh, tech audit changes and things like that. Mostly, uh, while we were in India, and it was getting near the end of the war, and we were doing a lot of planes were going down to Rangoon, we did lose one one plane, and pilot, and the, the sergeant crew chief, uh, he, they went down. And then... There's a letter there that uh, from the school up in Boston 
uh, one of the one of the students with us was from Texas, at a base down in Texas. And uh, of course, we were civilian clothes. And he came home, I took him home to my house a couple of times. He got to know my parents. and uh, But that letter was from his mother. Uh, and it was written mm, shortly after the war started. <clears throat> and her son uh, was listed as missing in action. And... Uh, so I've been trying to find out what happened. Uh, obviously, he was killed as a, down in his hometown. The Legion Post is named after him and stuff. But uh, uh, that's about <laughs> the only guy that I knew closely. There were a number of guys from Somerville that I knew. Uh, one walked out. And, uh, they had a caterpillar club. If they were downed and and uh, av avoided capture, and they w would walk out from Germany down through Spain, and they weren't allowed to tell anybody how they did it or what, and uh, they uh, uh, weren't allowed to go back into combat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so there were a lot of interesting things that happened, but nothing that I, I got a medal for, <laughs> except for good conduct. I got that. <laughs> And I got uh, area medals and a Chinese medal up there. So, uh, you have uh, besides the good conduct, do you have any individual awards that you're particularly fond of or proud of? So you know, area service, uh, China and uh, air, uh, defense ribbon. That's before the war. You got that, and uh, the Ch Chinese one is made in China. <laughs> Well, this is all being recorded, isn't it? <laughs> Where's the censor? Yeah. Well, while you were in the service, probably particularly when you went overseas, how, how did you stay in touch with family back home? Oh, interesting. I, I, on the, <laughs> we use mail, that's all, and they had a post office, you know, number to answer. But on the way over, uh, we stopped and... Hobart, Tasmania, down the very bottom of Australia. And uh, we were there for three days. And we were allowed to go ashore one day. Uh, somehow or other, I got to go three days. I don't think they know about this. <laughs> but I, I met a family there on the first day. And they had me to their home. And they had a motorcycle. And the pilot drove me all around, showed me all these prisoners. That was originally a, a prison facility down there and under the uh, Australia and uh, but they had a daughter was uh, maybe in the seventh or eighth grade and uh, it couldn't well, not even that much but uh, she started writing to my brother who was home uh, he was in the seventh or eighth grade and uh, so they corresponded for quite a while and uh, when we get up to India, uh, there was a Catholic uh, uh, orphanage there and uh, in Chittagong. And another fellow and I used to go and help the nuns, you know, fix furniture or, you know, do something. And sometimes we'd take a, a truck and take the kids out down to the beach there in uh, the Bengal Bay there. And... Uh, so the nuns started writing to my mother, and that went on for years. My mother had a group of women, they were sending them cards and all this stuff over there. So, uh, so there was correspondence going back and forth. Some of it probably shouldn't have, but, uh, but they did it. And uh, no, they, uh, over in China, it was, you know, no loss of correspondence. I didn't feel any. I was very faithful in writing home. See, I had uh, we were five boys in the family, and uh, at that time, three of us were in the service. My brother Paul was a uh, lieutenant in the Marines, retired as a, a lieutenant colonel. And my brother Tim, uh, I was old. I was number one, Paul was number two, Tim was number three, and Tim went in the Navy. So the, the three of us, the Marines, Army, and Navy, and uh, I was the only one who went overseas. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, you know, we got along. 
when I was down at Stinson Field waiting for assignment, uh, we were out uh, on the on the golf on a bivouac out there, it just toughen us up, you know. And uh, I I just got there and I knew my mother was having a baby. I'm I'm 21 years old and she's having a child, you know. And you you know that enlisted men couldn't get a leave if their wife was having a baby, you know? but. Uh, I did. <laughs> they came down and uh, took me out of the bivouac and put me on a plane, sent me up, and uh, I had an emergency uh, leave for my mother having a child. And uh, he's, he's, uh, he, he was in the service for the, uh, 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 what was the next war? Korea? <laughs> no, into China. Uh, uh, <clears throat> At the World War II. Oh, it was the Korea, yeah, yeah. Okay, no, uh, my brother that was home and, and in school when I was in the army, he wound up uh, a lieutenant in the in the navy during the Korean War, and then this one went in. Uh, uh, let's see, he, yeah, he he was uh, an engineer on the Hawk missile with Raytheon, and he's down in Camp Gordon, Georgia climbing telephone poles. <laughs> mm -hmm. So he took out as soon as he could. And the other one was in the Navy uh, for the, uh, uh, what's the war? Come on, I'm forgetting words. Vietnam. Vietnam, Vietnam. yeah. Okay. So <laughs> the five boys were all in the service, <laughs> one one order or another. My father was World War One. so. So what did you think of the, well, what did you think of the officers when you were serving, when you were in the military? Hey, just like the world, some nice and some aren't. But this one captain uh, that I mentioned uh, wanted me to go to OCS and everything, mm -hmm. Captain Dayton W. Countryman, never forget him. Nicest guy, you can want to be. Dayton really? W. Countryman. Countryman. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, he, he was just, he liked me, you know, obviously, you know, and uh, he really took care of me. But when this happened that I lost my stripes, he was on leave. <laughs> he wasn't there that morning to protect me. <laughs> but, uh, and I never had a chance to see him afterwards because he was transferred to another area. Uh, and uh, I never to, you know, apologize to him for screwing up. <laughs> yeah. But there, there were others that, uh, like the one that busted me, wasn't very nice to me. <laughs> I mean, apart from the fact that he was right. I mean, I screwed up and I, I should pay the price. And, but it hurt, I'll tell you. <laughs> did, uh, did you keep a journal at all? No, I was told not to. Oh. But I wrote to my mother religiously, and uh, for some reason or other, when I come home, uh, she'd thrown them all away. My brother in the Marine Corps, she saved all of his. <laughs> so, but that that I would like to have had those because I really put a lot of stuff in there that uh, yeah. a lot of girls too. <laughs> if you look at that book. <laughs> So your service ended. Um, do you remember the, your last day? Yeah. Tell me about that day. Anything significant about that day? Well, that was, you know, we got off the train and we were up at Fort Devens. And, uh, you know, my father, uh, God bless him, he, he was a fireman. And uh, he, I never told him I loved him. He never told me he loved me. But I know he did. Because... Uh, when we were going in the service, he's the only father that showed up. The other two guys, the father wasn't there. And he was at the train watching us go off. And uh, so then when I come home, he's up at Fort Devons waiting for me. And uh, then there was a lot of physical examinations and au revoir. <laughs> so that was it, yeah. He drove me home to Somerville from, from Fort Devons, yeah. You know where Fort Devons is, don't you? Yeah. yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> yeah, I've been there. Yeah. 
Um, so you came home, and you have a big homecoming, or it's pretty much no, 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 pretty much a no. Uh, I was uh, before the war. You know, before I went in the army, I was in the Sons of the American Legion. My father was very active, and uh, I played the drum and the drum corps and stuff like that. Plus, uh, April 19th was a holiday in Massachusetts, Patriots Day. So I never went to school. I paraded in the drum corps, and they had a big parade and stuff. And I went to the doubleheader with the, either the Braves or the Red Sox and with the marathon in between the two games. <laughs> so... That was my big day, and uh, so when I, I got out, I was uh, signed up for the Legion, and uh, I served as an officer in the, in the uh, Legion, and uh, in the parades and stuff, <clears throat> and uh, I eventually was uh, appointed the city treasurer and collector of revenue for the city of Somerville. So I was active in a lot of different things, and uh, I'm a late, I was there for six years, and uh, so. Uh, but uh, I just I, was, I looked at the American Legion. They <clears throat> they helped me get uh, recognition for my disability, ten percent, which put me on public law sixteen that paid all my tuition, my books, and with a uh, hundred and something bucks a month while school was in. So that was for, for five years. So, uh, uh, and I didn't have any more attacks, so as soon as I was finished, they cut me to zero. But that's all right. <laughs> but I always looked upon the veterans organizations. I'm a life member of the Legion, the VFW, and uh, the... Uh, uh, DAV and the uh, China Burma India Veterans Association. <laughs> so I looked at kind of like my union dues, you know, really that because uh, if I needed something with the VA, they were there to help me. And uh, but I know they're all going down the hill now. Nobody's right. The post I still belong to the post up in Somerville. They had, they had over two thousand members. Now they don't, barely have two hundred. Yeah, so I think a lot of guys are missing out, but a lot of, you know, experienced, trained people could help them. But, yeah. um, while you were in, did you make any, any close friendships uh, that you may, maybe you still have any contact with? The no, I lost some. <laughs> the, the two that I joined up with... Uh, the one that went into drum corps, I never really saw again. The one that uh, uh, was driving a gas truck, uh, well, he, we were friends, but he had all the good things in life, and I did, and I sort of tagged along, and he a lot of times took advantage of that. And when we were at Maxwell Field, one of the things you had to do was fight in the ring. And uh, we used to fool around like that, you know, before we went in the service. And he always beat me. He's bigger and tougher. I, I was 120 pounds. I saw some pictures there look at a stick. And, uh, but in this ring there, I beat him. And uh, he never was the same after that. <laughs> yeah. so, but anyway, but he wound up being a, uh, a pilot on the, on the small planes. Uh, pi a sergeant pilot, yeah. Oh, really? So, yeah, in uh, Pennsylvania. Yeah. Um, so, you went on to several different jobs after the service, but you get up to now, and you have public service. <laughs> well, I like to say I could never hold a job because every five years or so somebody would offer me a better one. So, uh, like I say, when I first got out, I was trying to practice law. And I just, you know, I had no connections. I wasn't doing anything for me. So uh, I was working as a mechanic up at Hanscom Field. 
and I had a wife and two or three kids by then. <laughs> and uh, but this mayor in Somerville was elected, and I had helped him campaign, and uh, he asked me if I'd like to be the city treasurer and collector of revenue. I said, I don't know anything about that. And he says, if you can't do better than what they've been doing, because it was a political appointee and it was usually a lawyer, and uh, he wouldn't spend ha half a day maybe, a couple of times a week in the, in the office, and they had a deputy who really, you know, was running the office. So I got into it, and uh, they were so far behind in everything that they did, and I became intrigued with it. And I made a lot of changes, significant changes. In fact, I wound up getting an award from the National International Association of Municipal Finance Offices. And at their meeting up in Montreal, they presented me with their gold medal award for outstanding contributions. So that was in my sixth year of being there. And I knew the mayor wasn't going to get reelected <laughs> for a third term. A fourth term, rather. So I, uh, I just said I'm available, you know, and uh, I, I wound up down here in Connecticut with the Connecticut Public Expenditure Council, which is a taxpayers kind of organization. And at that time, the big thing in Connecticut, they had just authorized the public, the uh, legislature, to uh, uh, change your charter. If you were selectman and you wanted something stronger or whatever, you could change it to mayor, council, manager. And the other one was the uh, uniform fiscal year, which towns and cities had always borrowed in advance of tax collections. And this put the tax collections on a, on a timing that you got it <laughs> when you needed it, you know. So, But it involved setting up bonds and things like that. So I was a consultant to cities and towns throughout Connecticut, and particularly on charters and with my legal background and uh, what I knew from, you know, local government finance, I was very, very helpful. And they used to call me Dr. Charter. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I got nice write-ups and stuff like that. So Hartford National uh, was competing with Connecticut Bank and Trust, the two major banks in Connecticut. <clears throat> And uh, CBT was very strong in their relationship with local governments and uh, helping them with bond issues and changing the year. And uh, they knew, Hartford National knew that I knew all the cities and towns now and had contacts. So they decided they wanted to beef up their municipal department. And uh, so they, they contacted me if I would be interested. And... Uh, I says, not for anything less than a vice president. <laughs> so they said, oh, yeah. And uh, one of them says, uh, can you sell? And I says, I don't know. How am I doing? <laughs> so they hired me, gave me the vice president. And uh, I was there for 12 years. Yeah. And uh, while I was there, I was very active in this. Government Finance Officers Association, the one that had given me the award. And uh, even though uh, I was not entitled to be a member, uh, I was an associate member, but they uh, had me on a committee <clears throat> with some of the top bond attorneys in the, in the country. And uh, so I was liaison on that, and I sat in on all their committees. And, I mean, they got to know me and everything, and... Uh, so well, things are going pretty well at, at uh, Hartford National. And uh, I was no longer challenged. I needed to, uh, I, a budget is a budget is a budget kind of thing. And, uh, and uh, I, uh, how did it start? Oh, the town of Greenwich uh, was one of the towns that I worked with on the charter. And uh, their finance director, finance officer was retiring. He'd been there for 20 years or something. And uh, I knew they were looking. And uh, I just said, well, you know, make me an offer, <laughs> which they did. And uh, while I was at Hartford National, one of the things I did was 
I was a selectman here in town. Uh, and the town was Republican, strong Republican. I was a Democrat. So there was two selectmen and a third selectman. They were two Republicans and one Democrat. So, you know, uh, I was allowed to make one motion. Adjourn. <laughs> not, it was not that bad at all because they knew, I knew, and uh, they trusted me. And we, we got a lot of things done, but they were having a real problem here in town. And so they changed the form of government to council manager, but direct election of the mayor, which was unique. And you were presiding officer of the, of the council. You weren't the administrator of the town. Uh, that You know, head of the departments and everything was a town manager. So uh, I ran for selectman. I was elected. And then they changed the charter. And I ran for mayor. And I was elected mayor for two terms here. And, uh, what years was that? Hmm? What, year, what years was that? Uh, it's up there someplace, 60, 60, I think 64, something like that. That's yeah, for mayor, huh? Newington? Newington, yeah. And uh, so it's a great town. I, I really liked it here. But uh, so uh, things weren't going exactly the way I liked it at the bank. And uh, they sent me to uh, Stonia School of Banking at Rutgers and, uh, you know, things like that. But I knew I was never going any place other than the job I had there. And uh, so I, I knew Greenwich was looking and I said I'd be interested. And so they, a bunch of them come up and interviewed me and uh, they offered me the job. So I went down to Greenwich for about 12 years or so as the chief finance officer and uh, made a lot of changes there too. But uh, it reached a stage where they ha had unions and there were only two of us that were in a union and the union guys were all getting raises and the two of us, one was personnel and one was me, who was pretty close to being a town manager, the job that I had. And uh, so uh, I worked for a board of finance and they approved everybody's budget. So. And I worked for them, but uh, I, I felt that I wasn't, my salary wasn't being reflected in what the union guys were getting. So I said something to the board one time, and one of the guys, this board was high class, uh, by very knowledgeable, very prominent, very important people. And this guy was a vice president at Pitney Bowes, and I said something about the salary. And he says, well, you're going to do better. I said, oh, wrong thing. <laughs> wrong thing to say to me. So I let it out that I, I, could, I was available. And this company just starting up, and it was about 50 employees, uh, insuring municipal bonds. So uh, they got in touch with me, and I went down and talked to them. And uh, so... Uh, I was appointed a senior vice president, national uh, representative and, right, to, with all the city and towns over the country that were issuing municipal bonds to get the bonds insured. They got a better interest rate then. And uh, so I was 62 years old then. So uh, they figured when I was 65 that it was time to retire. And uh, But again, I was traveling all over the country and, you know, people. on this organization that government finance offices, I wound up, once I got to Greenwich, being an, act, uh, uh, an active member now. And uh, I went through the chairs and became president and, uh, of that and 19,000 members of the United States and Canada, which was pretty impressive. <laughs> yeah, so, in fact, I'm the only living life member now that, uh, in the organization, so. But uh, uh, as I say, I kept moving. I kept being challenged, and I, I love the reading. Very lucky guy. In the meantime, I had five lovely children. <laughs> I was a family of five boys, and I have four girls and one boy. Oh, really? <laughs> so that was an experience in itself. Yeah. yeah. 
<laughs> well, how did your uh, service experiences, how did that affect your life? You know, looking back on it. Oh, you are you kidding? Service <laughs> I mean, best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, in school, I was sort of a, a wimp, I guess is the best word to describe it, you know. In high school, uh, I was younger than most of the kids in my classes. And uh, although, uh, you know, I, I was kind of active in high school a bit, and, but uh, I, I wasn't going any place. I wasn't, you know, the top of the class or anything like that. Not that I wasn't smart. I was. I get good grades, but I, uh, I, I just wasn't outgoing, and I wound up in the army. And all of a sudden, I'm in charge of you know forty people and twenty airplanes and stuff like that. And I'm only eight, nineteen years old. So uh, things changed for me. I learned a lot, and uh, I had a lot more confidence in myself. And getting those stripes back really did the trick. I. I I didn't let it change me, you know, so uh, I got out and, uh, you know, at law school I was a uh, class officer and in the top 10 or so members in, in the law school, but I had no connections, <laughs> yeah. so, but even there, I didn't really get away from the law because all of these things that I was doing involved some aspects of law, like the bond issues and the charters and all of that. And uh, I, I, even when I was uh, down in Greenwich and working, uh, becoming an officer in the, in the Finance Officers Association, I, I was on the Council of the American Bar Association. and. I never took a course in accounting, but uh, I wound up being on the uh, national, uh, oh, what do they call it? You know, the, in accounting, there's a financial standards boards mm -hmm. uh, for, for private uh, uh, accounting and then the Government Finance Officers Association. I was very active in GFO, in the Government Finance mm -hmm. Offices. And there was this contest of whether it was going to be the Financial Accounting Standards Board or the Governmental Accounting Standards Board. These people didn't want to let go of that. They, you know, they said there's no accounting over there. And interesting enough, one of the members of the board in Greenwich that I worked for was the chairman of the Financial Accounting Foundation. I'm going all over the country saying finance offices and and local governments and states, they have good accounting practices. We don't need <laughs> private system as would be adverse to a lot of things we're doing. So uh, they won. They set up the Government Accounting Standards Board and I was appointed at the Financial Accounting Foundation, which oversees these two, mm -hmm. provides their money and all that, and their direction orders. And there I'm on this Financial Accounting Foundation. I never had a course in accounting in my life. <laughs> I never told them that, but uh, it was interesting. I, I had a ball. <laughs> well, Bill, is there anything that you'd like to add that we have not covered in this interview? We missed no, it? as I told you, I'm just concerned that uh, I think I have some things that would be of interest to people. Uh, I don't know what to do with it. I'm 90 years old, and pretty soon i got to make a decision. <laughs> Or what I'm going to do with them. That's why I contacted you. And uh, if you have any thoughts on what I might do with that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. All right. Well, well, I want to thank you for your service and, and thanks for spending some time with you. You know, today. somebody says, I want to thank you for your service. And I says, it was my pleasure. <laughs> I came out of it alive. <laughs>